All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. 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 Amen, amen. That's good. Amen. Okay, so Peggy, I have a favor. Stand up and count the heads in the house today. Don't tell us the number. Okay, keep that in your head. Okay, I count you two too. Right? Yeah, count me too. But you know, I can run out the side door. Amen. Amen. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Amen. So good to see everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. We're going to do the announcement first. And we have a Saturday, September 25th, Shiloh Handmaiden meeting is rescheduled for this Saturday, February 25th. 12 15. 12 15. I can't be right. there. Oh. <laughs> All right. And then we have the pasta dinner covered dish after church on Sunday, March 5th. Donna is going to make her famous sauce and pasta Ooh, for me. I don't know what she make it for you. You got to share. Your man and God. <laughs> My man and God. That's two weeks from I'm now. excited for that. March 5th, Sunday, right after church service, we're having a covered dish. Bring what you will. We always ask to bring enough as if you were feeding your family that way. Everybody gets something, okay? So whatever you want to bring. I don't know what I'm bringing yet. <laughs> but uh, we'll bring something, amen? All right. Another announcement, Chuck King, as you see on the missionary board, he is going out on the missions field April 14th, 21st, through the 21st. We uh, support him, so keep him in prayer. He's going to Costa Rica. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I wonder if he's going to hit the beach. That's what I want to do. I don't know. <laughs> okay, keep Chuck King in prayer April 14th through the 21st. Amen? Remember, May 4th. Is National Prayer Day. May 4th. May 4th. May 4th. You'll be fasting and praying between 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. Drink, but no eat. Instead of eating, I want you to spend time in prayer and in God's Word because He'll reveal Himself through His Word as you're fasting and praying. You know, I, I've, I've said this before, but I don't think I've said it to you as a group. When you're fasting and praying, when you're praying for other people, God takes care of you while you're concerned for Amen. others. You know that, right? right? So as you're praying for our nation, you're praying for the church, you're praying for the schools, you're praying for the children, you're praying for the needs of your community. As you're praying, the National Day of Prayer is pray for our country. But I include it to everyone and everything. Whatever God puts on your heart, right. you should be praying about. Right. And God says, as you put your so much concern and intercessory prayer for others, he takes care of you in the background. Right. See? So you're going to be blessed. And I want you to believe that. I want you to expect that. You're going to be blessed because you're obedient to God's word. When God calls a fast, there's a purpose and a plan that he calls it. Amen. And God put it on my heart not just to pray on National Prayer Day, but to have the body of Christ, our church, be fasting. There's going to be a change. There's going to be something going on good for us. Amen? Amen. So you all agree, right? Yes. Amen. May 4th, between 11 and 1, no eat. No eat them. Okay. No pasta, no good stuff, no. <laughs> Drink fluids, plenty of fluids, okay? Amen. All right, and then we have the prayer list. Marsha O'Hara, as you know, she was admitted to the hospital this past week with stroke and brain bleed. She has been communicating. She has an MRI. It shows she had a need for her surgery. Um, there's a calcification behind the bleed, and we have no updates since that. So keep her in prayer, Amen. She's Amen. the young lady that sits in front of art usually on Sunday. Amen. So Josh and Nikki's two daughters, Avion and Hope, they have been tested. They have strep throat. They do not have COVID. Avion has a clogged ear. And um, Nikki. Nikki, as you can see, she's not here. She's feeling a <coughs> scratchy of the throat. So they're taking care of their family and Josh. So keep Josh and Nikki and their family in prayer. Amen. Amen. We are going to have uh, Pat Uhouse come up. Uh, we're going to anoint her with prayer. She's feeling, uh, she has a lot of health issues, and God's going to touch her. Amen. So I put it on her heart to anoint her with oil. Um, anyone else that wants to stand in proxy for any one of these mentions, come on up and say, I'm standing in proxy for these people, okay? Um, Myla and Elizabeth and family, we're praying for them. And Mike, let them know that God loves them. 
God knows what's going on with them. As you know, they've been in our prayer list, and we're going to continue praying, and we're going to expect God to touch the family. Amen? Amen. Myla, Elizabeth, the family, and Mike. Amen. Um, again, keep Chuck King in prayer. Uh, let's see. Peggy Kelvington. Praise the Lord. She's here. She had her eye good. surgery. She seems really good. How handsome her pastor is. She was saying I'm going to go those stairs. She's like, saw that I got a haircut. And she's got good eyes now, girl. <laughs> I'll see Praise the Lord. Time. Amen. Amen. <laughs> she's still really good. All right. So anyone else have prayer requests while we're here? Dee. The one that I gave you the paper. I got it. Okay. Myla, Elizabeth, family, and Mike. Yeah. Okay. I want to pray for my brother. He's been having problems with his blood pressure. Okay. It's been up crazy. He was at the hospital last night, but he's home today. Oh, good. All right. But he, they can't get it under control. Oh, gee. Okay. Me? Bill. <laughs> I was trying to, like, <laughs> put their hand up first. Pray for my wife, release on her feet. Okay. My name's Tammy. Uh, she's told she has pancreatic cancer. Okay. And she's been already taking like morphine. And at Christmas, I told them that's not good for her to be doing, but she's kind of stubborn. And for um, three people, um, Camilla, she uh, banged her toes because she needs a new screen door. And it was so windy, she went to grab the knob and it hit her in the side of the head and knocked her on the ground, and she got banged up toes now. For um, Alinda, she has dementia, and her husband, he's dealing with things too. Okay. All right. Uh, Pastor Ed. Did, did you mention Marsha O'Hara? I did, yeah. okay. yes. Pastor Ed, John Lynn, Tony, please come up. Pat, please come up. Donna, please come up. All of us, please come up. <laughs> I'm here in the spirit of the Lord. <laughs> We're all coming up. Amen. Tony, you're going to stand in for the other people. Pastor Ed, you're going to pray. I'm going to anoint. Julian, you're going to stand behind Pastor Ed. And... Uh, yeah, okay, you can stay there. Uh, let's have you touch Pastor Ed. The Lord just tell him, touch Pastor Ed. Somebody needs to touch Pastor Ed. As he's praying. Okay, so here's the thing. And people that, that they're viewing me, when we pray like in a community event like this, with a fam as a family, we are in agreement. Okay? So whatever is said in Pastor Ed's prayer, you're agreeing to. You don't change it. Right. Okay? You are agreeing, saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, amen, Lord, amen? amen? Okay, that's an agreement in prayer, amen? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch Pat and touch her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. I pray, Father God, that the blood of Jesus be poured over her even now as my hand is resting on her head, God, covering her body, her limbs, her muscles, her tissue, her organs, Father God, whatever is afflicting this child, God, you said that in the name of Jesus, she shall be healed. We claim the healing now, as God has said. Whatever we ask, believing, agreeing upon anything, call upon the elders and the deacons of the church, stand in agreement, and she shall be healed as we ask, God. For it is your will, God, that we be made whole. In the name of Jesus, let it be. Amen. Amen. Pastor Ed, would you pray for the rest? Heavenly Father, we just praise you and give you all glory and honor. Yes, Lord. Thank Lord, you. there's nothing too hard for you. Yes, Lord. You said you are our healer. Yes, Lord. You are our deliverer. Thank you. We lift up these requests here that each and every person on the sheet and those that have been spoken out. Yes. Father, we pray that you touch, yes. that you heal, you. Yes. that you deliver, yes. that you set it free, Father. Yes. Yes. Whatever it is, they don't know what it is. Yes. Father, you bring it forth. Yes. You said there's nothing hidden that you won't bring it up with yes. first. 
yeah. there, there be known. Yeah. So we thank you for it, Father God. We pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to be released. Yeah. We proclaim healing and yeah. deliverance yeah. for each and every one. Yeah. And we thank you for it, Father God. That it's done already. We receive it. We believe it. And we give you all yes. the glory, all honor, and all yes, praise. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. Praise you, God. Amen. Oh, Amen. hallelujah. Lift the name of Jesus up. Praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your heart. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Amen. All right. Without further ado, we'll have Jolene and Tony come up. Lead us in the worship. Amen. Continue in loving on God. Amen. Hallelujah. said it, let it be so. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter what we think. Doesn't matter what we try to comprehend. God said it. It is so. <coughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> if my people who are called by Yeah. 
Oh 
Now this morning, we'll be talking about giving unto the Lord. Somebody say that with me. Giving unto the Lord. Amen. And I bet most of all of us have seen kids fuss and fight all the time over something they have, right? Huh? Something that they have, something that they want, and sometimes they even fight over things they don't even want. Amen? <laughs> I'll explain it. What gets me about kids today is how a kid can have a favorite toy and have it in the middle of the floor. And if two or three kids would be playing, one kid gets up and goes to that toy, and it seems like they all want that toy. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I seen that this week, and I was blessed. And I was like, Lord, what are you showing me? Huh? All right. What is really funny is that they don't even argue over this toy, over whose it is. They just want it. They claim it. Mm -hmm. Amen? And they hold on to it for dear life. Huh? They didn't want it until someone else wanted it. Amen? Yep. Yep. <laughs> and now that it's the most important toy in the room. They got to have it. Yep. Amen? They don't want to let go. Well, my wife and I had only one child, so this wasn't a problem as such. But even when she had friends over, we saw that the, she had a difficult time sharing and giving. Other kids would bring a toy or game to our house, and Erin would want to check it out and play with it and even have her friend come over and tingle with it a little bit. She'd have no problem. But the moment that friend wanted one of Erin's toys, hello, Erin would rush over and make some type of excuses why they can't touch that toy. <laughs> Like, oh, let me show you how that works. And quickly she shows them. Then she puts that toy aside and distracts the kid so that kid doesn't go back to that toy. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Something else she would do is she'd take that toy and she'd show it to him. And she goes, oh, but you can't play with this one because this is my special toy. <laughs> huh? We all want our kids to share. Amen? Amen. We all want our kids to be giving kids, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to be a giver, not always a taker. No matter what that special toy is. Amen? <laughs> we tell the kids, let the other kid play with it a while, and then you'll get it back. <laughs> Man, it's like a death grip when that child has that toy. You don't want to let it go, right? <laughs> they didn't want to play with that thing at all, but Erin must have felt that like, this was forced upon her to give it to someone else. She couldn't bring herself to do it. And then authority had to demand that she give the toy up. At first... We were shocked at Aaron's behavior, but quickly we realized that this is an only child, so understandably, she doesn't know how to freely give, freely share, amen? <laughs> Not having many kids around most of the time. And then we knew that she had to prepare to share and prepare to give, so we had to give sharing lessons, amen? <laughs> My wife and I had to talk to her a few times before she got the idea that sharing is a must-do in life. As I was preparing this morning's message, God put this experience in my mind, and Holy Spirit said to me, listen, check it out. Many Christians act the same way when it comes to certain things. Right. Wow. I mean, that was crystal clear in my thought as I'm thinking back. I saw these kids at work doing the same thing. Then I remember Aaron doing the same thing. And after the thought passed, God spoke those words to me. Many Christians have the exact same hardship in giving and sharing. Wow, Christians, he said. He called us out. <laughs> God put us on the spot. Christians have a hard time sharing and giving. Well, needless to say, <laughs> the Lord said, you got to speak about that. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I was like, Lord, you got to get me prepared for this. I've never spoke on this subject. you got to get me. <laughs> the Lord spoke to my heart and shared that some Christians feel that when he is directs them to give, that they feel forced to give something up. And they will hang on to it just like that child fighting over their toy. Oh, I want to repeat that. The Lord said to me, some Christians feel that when he directs them to give, that they feel forced to give something up. And they will hang on to it just like that child fighting over their toy. <coughs> then my thoughts went to a time when I came to church and the pastor started preaching and I instantly got upset. I thought, man, I came to church to feel good, <laughs> to get a good promise from the Lord, to hear how good God is, or God rescued somebody, God gave a miracle to somebody, and hear pastors speaking of something that he has no business speaking, speaking about. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, I believed at the time that I just tuned him out for most of the sermon. 
Sorry, Pastor, I now see the error of my ways. <laughs> Many people do that when the subject of giving is preached about. People, <laughs> listen, I had someone count the heads in the house. I expect to see that every head still accounted for in the midsection of this message and next Sunday. <laughs> I want to say about two or almost three years ago, I preached on how our Heavenly Father showers us with gifts. And I used visual aids to bring the message by going out and buying little gifts and placing them on the table before the altar. And I had Pastor Ed, our missionary pastor, give out to each person a gift from the table. You remember that? Yes. Most of you are here to saw that, right? I and I had, he, I had him come up and I said, I want you to be able to give the gifts out. You're going to act as representative of the Holy Spirit. I'm the pastor. You're representing the Holy Spirit. He said, oh, wait a minute now. He said, I got an idea, if you, if you don't mind, if I inject something. I said, what's that? He said, I want my back turned to these people. You know, you got a $100 bill on that table. You got $50 bill on that table. You got, you got all kind of nice gifts on that. And then you got a broom and a mop, and you got a bucket over there. You got, you know, I don't want them getting mad at me. That I could have got the $50. I didn't get $100, but you gave me a broom and a mop. And he said, I want my back, so they don't know. I don't see who I'm giving what to. They can't say. And you know what? That's an awesome thing. You know? <laughs> So he turned his back and he handed each person one gift, knowing with, not knowing who gets what. Right. You guys remember that, right? Yes. Yeah. Some got money. Some got a new Bible. Some got a mop in a bucket. <laughs> some got a plaque with a scripture on it. Some got word search puzzles on it, and so on. I got a lantern. You got a lantern. I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> Holy Spirit had me put on each gift a tag which spoke what the gift represents. And when that particular gift was given, it represented the gift that God has given to each and every one of us, a person. Money was given to meet the need of that person. The Bible, of course, was to learn of God's promises. The mop in a bucket was a gift representing a job from the Lord or a ministry. The plaque with the scripture represented, of course, exhortation, always willing to show compassion, a smile, give a hug. A God-given word in other need. Word search puzzles was a gift representing the gift of always finding the right word as in counseling or teaching someone in the word of God. You get the idea, right? Yeah. Well, Pastor Ed made me laugh when he said, I'll pass the gifts out as you've asked me to, but I plan to turn my back and give them <laughs> so that people don't get mad at me. And I thought about this message this morning. Don't get mad at me. This comes from your Heavenly Father. As you know, I pray all week long and I prepare as God gives me. And he'll show me things throughout the week. He'll speak to me certain things throughout the week. And I jot them down and I put it all together on a Thursday night. And I put it together as the Lord asked me to. Don't get mad at your pastor. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord said, let him do as he says. Because I also give out my gifts in indiscriminatory. I know respect of persons. I give, I give as I would give them out without prejudice. That's what the Lord told me when I set the table for you. The Lord set a table before you, and he says, I give indiscriminately, meaning he gives as he sees fit, right? He doesn't choose one over the other. He gives as he has felt to give, that he knows what your need is. And I thought, wow, this was a great message. I really enjoyed that. I've done it twice. I loved it so much. And we had so many influx of new people, they didn't experience that, so I did it twice. I did it at the health center. I did it here. And God gives as he gives freely. Amen. God gives lovingly, freely. Amen. And God has given his people pastors that are led to lead people in the ways of the Lord. We are to teach, we are to direct, and even correct within the body of Christ. Amen. And the greatest teaching aid that God gives to the pastor to use and to help teach you, to direct you, to correct in love, the greatest teacher that I have is the Holy Spirit. Amen. The greatest tool that I have is God's very word. A pastor is not God's under-shepherd if he does not have love for the sheep. Amen. I say this because I need you to know and remember who I am. <laughs> I'm your brother. I'm Bob, the same Bob that you've known for years, a lot of you. Most every one of you. I have not changed from the time that you've known me to present. Other than maybe grow maturely in the Lord a little bit more. Yep. Amen? Thank you. And his love for God, my love for God, is still strong. A pastor's love for God is strong. A pastor's love for God's people is strong. And 
it motivates the pastor to always preach and minister God's word in obedience as Holy Spirit directs them. Can you tell I'm preparing you for a strong message? <laughs> as your pastor, I preached on how God's people should spend their time in prayer, studying God's word, sharing your time, witnessing for Jesus. I have preached on the gifts of God and how to use those gifts, such as I've just shared with you. I have preached on what the church is and what she is not, and how to teach and lead others in the family belonging to God. All these, as far as I can tell, were re well received. And I don't think it was because of who I am or that I preached it good. <laughs> I believe it's because in these messages, God, through the Holy Spirit, spoke to your heart to prepare and also to receive God's word and use me only as a tool of his within his hand. The message, again, is God giving unto us. But today's message is titled also, Giving Unto the Lord. Amen? God gave to us. We are giving unto the Lord. I'm going to be speaking on a subject that I have not touched on in the three years as your pastor. And I haven't because God said not to. Basically, that's it. Why haven't you taught on this subject? I've had one person ask me that. And I said, the Lord told me not to. Specifically said, do not. It's not time. And they said, well, why was that? And I said, well, the Lord said, until a sheep gets to know my heart and my commitment as pastor, I'm not to touch the subject. As I was praying and studying for a message today, the Lord spoke one word to me, giving me the subject to preach on. And that word was stewardship. Everybody say stewardship. 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 The word stewardship means the job of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or property. Listen to this. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. I want to repeat that. The simple, careful, responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. When money is preached about in the church, <laughs> many feel like the preacher is out to get their money. <laughs> and when I first started going to church and I heard this, I, and I shared it with you, I thought the same thing. <laughs> Man, he has no business asking for money. God puts it on the heart of the people to give, and they give what they can but I soon learned that that was not what was happening at all. He wasn't looking to get my money. I had to force myself to stop and listen to exactly what the pastor was saying. Much like my daughter Erin had to force herself to stop holding on so tight to that toy and listen to her loving father's direction. I am not a prosperity preacher, as you well know. In other words, I don't preach to give unto God to get from God. Hello? Amen. I see so much on television where people preach on health, wealth, and prosperity, and they build these beautiful churches. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with a beautiful church. I hope to do more for our own. But some I've heard telling the poor of the poorest in our country that to become rich, they need to send their money to this ministry or to that ministry. I'm totally in disagreement. And this is where people shut down on God and on the practice of attending church. They think and say, well, I knew it. That church doesn't miss me or want me. They want and miss my money. And so I'm not going to be there. Yeah. He is no longer alive. But when I first got saved, a minister that I was watching on TV one time said, if you send me $10, I can assure you that God will send back to you $100. <laughs> Why well, send the $10? <laughs> I did not get the $100 back. <laughs> Now, I believe that God blesses the giver, but I also know that God is not a money changer. Amen. Somebody say it with me. Amen. God yeah. is not a money changer. If it worked out like that, God being a money changer, that ministry would be sending every person in America $10 so they could get $100 back. <laughs> huh? But it doesn't work like that. But I will tell you one thing. You will never be able to outgive your God. Amen. Somebody say amen. amen. You will never be able to outgive your God. Amen. So let's talk about the stewardship of giving today. Not because I feel that anyone here is not tithing or not giving as God leads it upon your heart, but because God said it is a requirement, it is accountability and responsibility of the body of Christ to give. Amen? amen? God has given me the direction to preach on this subject. He gave me the green light. So here we are. We're going to talk about tithing, 
and offerings and alms today. Amen? Amen. God's word speaks of tithing. And if God sees it important enough to teach in the Bible, then it's also important to teach it from the pulpit. Amen? Yes. A few years ago, I read something in Reader's Digest and I cut it out knowing that someday I was going to use it. <laughs> Not knowing when, but here we are today. We're going to use it. Listen to this. <coughs> Reader's Digest said, on average, 90% of the work done in the church in our country is done by 20% of the people. And it's also true that 90% of the tithes and offerings that are given to the church is given only by 20% of the people. That's bad. Yeah. <laughs> That's very poor. Yeah. Hello? Now, I don't know what the percentage is here in our church. And we're not even going to study about the percentage here in our church. That's not important. I don't even want to know what the percentage is here of our church. Who's giving, who isn't. That's not my business. That's not why I'm speaking about this. I don't even know what anyone gives other than myself, and I do not want to know what anyone gives. That's between you and God. So you can see, I am not out to get your money. Hello? Amen. But I think for God to bring this up, I'm thinking that all too often, we have a misunderstanding about what tithes and offerings are all about. As I said during the opening of this morning's service, many people feel like someone is trying to force them to do something. They are going to hang on to that much tighter. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I'm going to say that in order to be in any part of the fivefold ministry, whether it be a prophet, a evangelist, a pastor, a teacher, a missionary, that one must be teachable. Amen? Amen. As a people of God, we must be teachable. Amen. There's always going to be something new that God wants to show us, to teach us, to mature us in the things of God. This happens to be one of a mighty need in the body of Christ today. Because one cannot give what he does not have. Therefore, you have to teach to be able to know and understand. And then you know what it is to give. Amen? Amen. And I, just as anyone, had to learn what it is to tithe and give offerings. And it will not help anyone or better their relationship with God if I give only my own thinking or my own conviction on the subject. So I'm careful to only give God's word as best as I am able. Amen. So I'm guiding most of my conversation as I have it written. I'm going to try not to get away from it because I don't want you misunderstanding. So let's look to God's word and see what he has to say on giving unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. As we look to God's word, let the Holy Spirit guide us while we are reading his word. And let Holy Spirit help us see what God expects of us. Amen? Amen. So you have your Bible with you? Let's turn to Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. It is the very last book of your Old Testament just before you enter your New Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. No. <coughs> before I read that, I, I can tell you that if you study the entire book of Malachi, you'll see there's only four chapters long. <laughs> But in it, you'll find that the nation of Israel was in a great spiritual decline. This is the people of God in a great spiritual decline. The temple, which had been destroyed and in ruins by their enemies, had been reconstructed. But corruption had been allowed to enter in. Malachi was a prophet of God, and he preached against the people, saying, You offer polluted bread upon the altar, meaning that corruption amongst God's people was widespread. The pleasure and desire of people became more important to them than their service unto the Lord. And divorce was a major issue of that day. Does this sound familiar to our church today? Mm -hmm. yeah. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. Because I, the Lord, do not change. Somebody say that with me. Because I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you children of Jacob are not destroyed. Even since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and haven't kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you. Somebody say it with me. Return to me, and I'll return to you. These people don't hear you on the video. I can't hardly hear you. Return to me, and, and I, I will return, return to, you. to you. Amen. How will we return? They, they ask God. And God's answer is this. Will a person rob God? Wow. Oh. Yet, you are robbing me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? By the tithe and the offering. 
You are cursed under the curse, the entire nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the entire tithe into that storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Somebody say, bring the entire tithe. Bring the entire tithe. So put me to the test, is this right now, says the Lord of the heavenly armies. And see if I won't throw open the windows of heaven for you and pour out on you a blessing without measure. And I'll prevent the devourer from harming you so that he does not destroy the crops of your land. Nor will the vines of your fields drop their fruit, says the Lord of the heavenly armies. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of the heavenly armies. Amen. Amen. Somebody say amen. Amen. In verse 7, God says that they have turned away from his decrees and have not kept them. In other words, they have broken the law. They have failed to keep the commandments that God had given them. And not only that, they began breaking the law. For, they, they had been breaking the law for a very long time, even from the time of their fathers. Malachi 3.8. Will a man rob God? Man. When pastor spoke that behind this very pulpit, I, he got my attention. I raised my head up and I really wanted to hear. Did I rob God? Did I really? Could you rob God? How do you rob God? I was asking the same question that Israelites were asking. We robbed God. God, you need to tell me how I robbed you. You need to explain yourself. What does that mean that I robbed God? Amen? Here is one point on which you're guilty, the prophet says. You withheld the tithes and your offerings from the temple of God. Hello? You have withheld the tithes and the offerings from the temple of God so that, listen, that divine worship is neglected. Hello? Amen. I point this out to show that God isn't talking to the people as individuals, but as a whole nation. You see? And then God speaks to his people with love and a promise, even though they have disappointed him. God basically said, I have commanded you to do something, and you have failed to do it. But if you return to me, if you obey me, I will return to you. I will bless you. Hello? Amen. Listen, God is saying here that he no longer is with the nation. Wow. He has departed from them. He has gone out and not present himself among them anymore. And the people looked at Malachi, the messenger of God, and they arrogantly asked him, why would God leave us? And wait a minute, he said, return him. How are we to return? In other words, the people said, what do you mean, God? What are you talking about? We have done nothing wrong. We're a righteous people. You said it yourself. We're your chosen people. So like, yeah, what are you really talking about? And wait, how are we to return? I, I, I thought we were with you. I thought you were with us. What's this mean? We are to return. And God again speaks to their spirit. Is God speaking to yours and mine? Will man rob God? Yeah, you rob me. You see, these people who profess to love God, who claim to know his laws better than any other people, is not now even acknowledging that they've even departed from God's law. In verse 8, they said again, how do we rob you? <laughs> now, thanks be to God. I'm no expert on robbery, but I believe there's only two ways you can rob someone. Huh? You can either take something that belongs to somebody else with or without their knowledge, or you can keep something, hold something back that belongs to somebody else. I think number two fits us. You can keep something or withhold something back that belongs to somebody else. Psalm chapter 50, verse 8 through 12. Go there with me, please. Psalm chapter 50, verse 8 through 12. I'll give you a minute. When you have to say amen. Psalm chapter 50, verses 8 through 12. Amen? It reads, listen, my people. Hello? He's talking to you and I. God's people. Listen, my people, for I am making a pronouncement. Israel, I, God, your God, am testifying against you. Oh, my goodness. That doesn't feel good at all. <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> no. God's speaking to me and says, I got something against you. Oh, my. 
He says, I did not rebuke you because of your sacrifices. Indeed, your burnt offerings are continually before me. So here he's saying, listen, I don't have a problem with your service unto me. I will no longer accept sacrificial bull from your household, though, nor goats from your pens. Indeed, every animal of the forest is mine. Oh, hear this. Every animal of the forest is mine, even the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds in the mountains. Indeed, everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, along with everything in it. You see? What did you get out of that? What I got was, I don't know about you, what you're getting out of your Bible, but I found that it's this not the only place in my Bible that shows that everything in the universe belongs to God. That's what I got out of it. Huh? And it's not the only place in the Bible that says that everything in the universe belongs to him. But God said, everything that you see with your eyes, that you experience in your life, belongs to me. I have no need to ask you for a loaf of bread. I have no need to ask you for a penny. You see? If I were hungry, I would not even tell you, for the world is mine along with everything in it. God does not need your money. Amen. Amen. But God expects you to give. And we'll see why. Amen. Amen. Now you remember I shared with you the word steward, right? What it means. In case you forgot, I'll say it again. Stewardship means the job of supervising or taking care of something, such as an organization or a property, or I like this one better. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. Huh? Something that's entrusted to your care. Your management of it. You're responsible. Your accountability to what God has given you. This is the mean that God has entrusted you and me unto some of the things that which he owns. Huh? And he has allowed us to be stewards and keepers of. And God has given you and I authority of what belongs to him. <laughs> That's an awesome position, right? <laughs> I have authority over what God says is his. Huh? I manage what God says is his. <laughs> wow. If you were a supervisor, you managed over somebody else's money. Could you mismanage people's money? Yeah, very easily so. My wife handles a lot of money in her job as HR. A lot of payroll. She makes one little mistake, buddy. She's going to hear about it from the person that she's supposed to be paying. How about you? Now, here's the thing, people. To keep something back, hello? To keep something that belongs to God and not let them have it, not let him have it, take control, manage it, misuse, waste it, wander it, keep it back for yourself, that is what's called robbing God. Hello? To keep something back, to keep something that belongs to God and not let him have it is called robbing God. It's simple to understand, isn't it? <laughs> simple to understand what it means to rob someone. And God responds to the nation of Israel. He responds to their arrogance when they ask the question, how do we rob you? <laughs> God responds, in your tithes and your offerings. If you don't know what the word tithes means, in the law of Moses, written in the book of Leviticus, chapter 27, the Israelites were commanded to tithe. And this included from the seed of the land, the fruits of the trees, and every tenth animal from the herd. And tithing had been much been around much longer than even the time of Moses. Because the people didn't have money. So they traded and they did business with their fruits of the land, right? And vegetables, the fruits. They did business with the animals, trading it off, a goat for a cow, a cow for pounds of butter, bread, meat, whatever. Amen? Tithing had been around much longer than the time Moses brought down to the people of the law of God. Genesis chapter 14, we see that Abraham gave one-tenth of all his goods of pain in battle. He gave the tithe to Melchizedek. In Genesis chapter 28, Jacob promised that he would give a tenth of all he had received from the Lord. A tenth. And if you read the biblical account of Cain and Abel, it is also mentioned that they also offered up sacrifices unto God. One gave of his fruits and the other gave of his animals. Now some people would argue that what all these people gave in the Bible were in the form of fruits, plants, and animals. And it's just not done today. But it is done. 
I just shared with you. It is done because that was their income. Fruits, vegetables, animals. And out of the income, they gave a tenth of their income unto the Lord. But they say it's not a valid argument. Because in their day, the fruits and the animals and the, the plants were just their food. This is basically their money given back to them. That's what I said. This was what they had to survive, to live on. This is what they did commerce with. When the Bible talks about wealthy men like Job and Abraham, it talks about the cattle they possess. Huh? Their food and the cattle were no different than our money is to them today. Amen. To you today. To survive, you and I need money. Amen? Amen. Look again to Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 with me. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Now, we have established that the time to tithe has always been set from the beginning to present. It has never changed. Remember, your scripture tells us that God does not change, neither yesterday, today, but he is the same forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, tithing had been established way before even the law of Moses in the land. And tithing, again, is consistent, persistent, and established for you and I today. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. There's a couple of things I want to show you here that I saw as I studied this way back in the day. And recently, I asked the Lord to show me again to refresh my memory of what I've learned about tithing. And as I asked, I said, Lord, show me how to explain about the gross. Because a lot of people become offended to this part, too. Huh? Well, I'm living off of the net, not the gross. The government gets most of it. <laughs> so I should be Tithing off the net, not the gross. Because I would get the net. This is what the Lord showed me. Am I to tithe on my gross pay or my net, Lord? I asked way back in the day. Let me explain the gross. The gross pay is the whole amount you get paid before your taxes, before your union dues, before your insurance premium comes out, before your 4K is taken out of your paycheck. That's your gross. The net pay is the amount you take home after all these above mentioned items are taken out. Yeah. Amen? So the easiest answer and explanation, explanation I could come up with was this. Excuse me. If you make $5 an hour and the government took $4 an hour out of your pay, you still made $5 an hour. Somebody took the other four. Hello? Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that my house might be full. <coughs> NIV Bible says it this way, bring the whole tenth into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Bring the whole tenth. Now I don't know what you hear, but I hear God wants all of it. Hello? Amen. God wants a tenth of everything. Yep. After all, everything belongs to him. <coughs> Amen. Look at it this way. God has supplied everything we need. He's given us the word. He's given us life. He's given us provision for all our physical needs. All the fruits, the plants, the lands, the water, the animals. All that he has created has been given to you. It's for your good. It's for your use. It's for your pleasure. It's for your enjoyment. And he's only asking a tenth in return. A tenth of $100 is how much? $10. That's not much. $90, God says, put in your pocket. I'm only asking for a tenth. Now that we measure our wealth in money instead of capital, God's laws did not change. Neither did his measuring system. Hello? <laughs> he still requires a tenth in return. God's word says, bring the whole thing into the storehouse. So it's the tenth of the gross amount. The gross amount of all that you bring in. Amen. What does it mean when God says, bring it into the storehouse? <laughs> What's God referring to to bring it into the storehouse? What is the storehouse? Church. Amen. The storehouse was either back then Pacific rooms inside the temple itself, or they were building, uh, building buildings that attached to the temple. And the temple was the local place of worship. Why? Well, if you relate it to our day today, God is bringing a whole tithe into your local church. Amen? 
Now you see, I'm going to tell you about why the tithe came to the church. You see, the tithe were given in a tent to the church, to the Levite people. And the Levite were priests, selected men of God that were in charge of the functions of the church, such as ministering the word, taking care of the church, all the aspects of the church. They did not work outside the house of God. They did not have a secular job like your pastor had, like, like most pastors in the world today. We have secular jobs because we can't afford, the church cannot afford to sustain me on the church's pay itself, you see. The Levites were from the tribe of Israel that were to be priests. These pastors did not receive land inheritance like the other tribes of Israel. They were to be brought to the tithe, or excuse me, the tithe was brought to them so that they could survive and live. And so they could spend all their time doing the work that God had called them to do. And even with a little further than that, the tithe was used to also do the work of the Lord, such as send prophets out, send evangelists out, take care of God's people doing the work of the ministry. Amen? Amen. Look with me, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 12 through 13. Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 12 through 13. Very first part of your Bible. What chapter again? Chapter 26, verse 12 through 13. <clears throat> it reads, When you have finished your harvest, reserve the tithe in the third year, the year of the tithe, and give the entire tithe to the descendants of Levi, to the foreigners, to the orphans, to the widows, so that they may eat and be satisfied in their cities. <clears throat> then declare in the presence of the Lord your God, I have removed the holy offering from my house and given it to the descendants of Levi, to the foreigners, to the orphans, and to the widows as you have commanded me. I have not violated nor forgotten your commands. Amen? Amen. You see, the tithe is also to go for the needs of the body of Christ. <clears throat> the tithes go to the poor. And under tithes, you'll have a word that says offerings, and you'll have a word that says alms, and we're going to talk about the difference, all right? The tithe was used to, for the kingdom of God, to the minister, to the church, to carry on the work of the Lord, and then the offerings were to help those in need, as I mentioned earlier. Offerings, what are they? Their offerings are that which is given above the tithe, above the tenth, amen? You know how we've had different ministers coming in, and we'd have a basket back there, and I'd make an announcement at the end of the service where he is done speaking. I say, let's give up as unto the Lord. Give unto this man of God who came to us and gave us the word of God so that he can go forth and proclaim the gospel. Amen? Amen? We're encouraging him. We're paying him for not his service, for God takes care of him in his service, but we're giving him the ability, the strength to go on and carry on and carry the word somewhere else. Amen. You see? Amen. That is the offerings. And then alms are given to the poor. It's given to aid or assist in the care of the poor, the widows, the orphans, and those who have suffered a great loss to help in getting them strengthened and getting them into a good place, you see. So tithe is given to the church that you attend and where you're being fed, where you're being nurtured and cared for by the word of God in the specific house of God that God has you for, amen. And then we have to entrust this pastor and the, those that are overseers in the church to use that money as God directs them to give it. Amen? Amen? And I've had some people say, not here, but in another church, they shared, pastors that share with me, people get mad when they find out that the tithe was used for this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, why would they get mad? If they entrusted God with their tithe, then God is seeing fit to use it as he pleases. We just heard that. Who are you to tell me, right? Who am I that I would have to ask you for a loaf of bread, God is saying. Everything in this world belongs to me. Amen. 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 So once you give your tithe, you give it unto God and you entrust God to do as he sees fit. Amen. And then you have the right attitude in giving. I'm not giving to the pastor to ride no Cadillac. I'm not giving to a pastor so he can build a mansion. Huh? I don't care if your cat pastor does drive a Cadillac lives in a mansion. That's not where your tithe's going. If he's truly a man of God. Amen. God sees where his money goes. God controls where his money goes. God is the authority, supreme authority over everything he has. 
so that it would help you with your attitude and giving. Well, Pastor, I know you're doing okay because you've got two jobs, you've got a wife that works, and so I'm giving my $20. <laughs> huh? You, you, you can have that little bit. You're not giving to me. I don't need your money. My wife and I work. I, I'm not ashamed to say, I don't get paid as your pastor. I do not. I do not receive a paycheck, and neither do I want one. I've never asked for one, I never sought for one, never expected one. When I got into the ministry, I said, Lord, I don't need to get paid. I like my job. <laughs> I love my job. And so I don't need to get paid. I'm not looking for a big church to pay me and take care of me. I have a house I pay for, I own. I have two, uh, two brand new vehicles that I have. I don't need your money. I'm talking to you and the viewers too. Your pastor doesn't need your money. Amen. The church needs your money. Amen. The house of God still has bills to pay. Amen. The house of God has a gas bill. I just spoke with the director about what the bills are right now. He didn't know what the message was going to be, and he was filling me in what the bills come in. I thought, oh, geez, Lord, you really want me to have this message. This is confirmation you want me to tell. Your gas bill this month for this church is $700. Wow. Your insurance to have the church and the school and the house is $3,000 some odd dollars a year. But your gas bill is $700. Your electric bill is? What? What's the electric bill? <laughs> That was 150. Electric bill is 150 dollars. Yes, less than now. Yeah. Summertime. Yes, summertime. <laughs> Gonna get more. Mm -hmm. But we have gas. We have water. We have sewage. We have garbage. We have recycling. We have everything that your house would have. The church has. Exactly. So I'm not speaking just to Shiloh because I have a lot of members, 150 members watching us. So I'm speaking to you as well. If you consider this your church. And even though you're unable to climb the stairs to get here, you still have a lot of patience. If we are indeed your church, then you need to pay your tithe, 10% of your tithe, to this church. Amen. Amen. Because we will not continue on if we don't have money coming in to pay the bills. Just as you get shut off notices, we haven't. Praise God. God kept us. God keeping us. We haven't got shut off notices. But it's possible if the money doesn't come. Right? God doesn't need your money. He takes care of it. And that's what I'm getting to. You right. see where the need is, right? It doesn't go in your pastor's pocket, right. but it goes toward the ministry, Amen. the church, Amen. the care of God's house. The bathrooms need help. I'm using my own money to pay bills. Or excuse me, not to pay bills, I'm sorry. To, to remodel the bathrooms. I'm, I'm saving it up. I got an idea. I got a plan for the bathrooms downstairs. They need help. I'm willing to do that. See, it comes from my heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Somebody who gives freely as God gives you freely, you see. Amen. And I'm not patting myself on the back here. I'm saying, your pastor's willing to dig in. I need, God wants, God needs, God requires, God expects us all to give in. Amen. 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 To care for his house, to care Amen. for the ministry. I'm not correcting you. I'm giving you what God told me to give you and teach. Amen. Okay? Because, like I said, I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give. I'm not saying somebody gives more, somebody gives less. I don't care. I'm telling you what God puts in my heart to give you, and God will deal with you in your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. God was talking to his nation. You see, why I said that is because God's not pinpointing individuals. He's talking to his body, his believers, his Amen. whole people. Amen? Amen. So God's not picking on you. <laughs> God's not sending you out. God was talking to the nation. God told the whole people of Israel that they were robbing him. And then God went to tell them that they were under a curse because they were robbing them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> a curse? <laughs> yeah, a curse. There was a drought. There were locusts eating up the plants. Grapes were falling off the vine before they were ripe. I can hear the people now. It was kind of like the people were saying, well, God, you've noticed what's been, it's been a bad year. <laughs> what do you expect me to give? <laughs> the very fruits of the land, the very vegetables of the land. Is, is, I don't have much. That's my income. You've noticed it's been a bad year. We cannot afford to tithe. You have you heard that before? I can't afford to tithe the whole thing. I'll give what I can. Okay. Acceptable. God saw that a woman gave a penny and said she gave more than all of you. Because you are giving out of righteousness, out of the law, out of something that controls you. She's giving from her heart. That which she doesn't even have, she's willing to give. You see? Yeah. People don't tithe because they, they say they can't because of debt. 
They don't tithe because they say the utility bills went up. They can't tithe because they said eight or five dollars a dozen. <laughs> I have to save for a new car. My furnace broke down this morning. I still gave my tithe. <laughs> you know what happened? Amen. God said, oh, here, here's, here's some money that is due you. I said, oh, that came the perfect time because my furnace broke down this morning. No. I said, oh, Lord, look at that. Amen. My point in sharing this, you give unto God. What did I say earlier? You cannot outgive God. Amen. You give what you're supposed to give, and God will take care of all the rest. You see? Amen. God is saying, you can't afford not to tithe. <laughs> huh? Yeah. All that which he has given you belongs to him. And he said, everything that I've given you has blessed you, kept you, provided for you. It just gives you the joy and satisfaction of the life that you have. And I'm asking, but of all, very small piece. And you want to hold on to it as a child holds on to that toy, don't want to give it up. Huh? You didn't even know what you had until God gave it to you. <laughs> you didn't even know what you was yours until I told you what was yours. All heaven and earth is yours. <laughs> and you're going to hold on to that small 10%? Ouch, God says. You pinch God's hand by grabbing a hold of that thing so tight. <laughs> There was drought. There were locusts eating up the plants, grapes falling out the vine before they were ripe. There was a curse on the people of God. People don't tithe again because they say they can't afford to tithe. God's saying to you, you cannot afford not to tithe. Amen. You're robbing me. God is telling us that if we will obey him in this, he will return to his commands. And he will say, I will open up the floodgates of heaven. I'll pour out such a blessing upon you that you don't even have room for all of it. Hello. That's what I want. How about you? Amen. Not that that's the ultimate reason why I want to give, but I know if I give as God tells me to give, I'm not going to fear I don't have money to pay the bill. Huh? I'm not going to fear I'm going to come up short at the end of the month. I'm not going to fear that I don't have the money to pay the taxes. You see? <laughs> I'm going to confess to you. I told you last week, and I've been telling you since I've been your pastor almost three, well, no, it's been three years now, huh, Joanne? Almost four. I've been your pastor almost what? Four. Almost four. Oh, we that went fast. Almost four years. I've always been real and upfront with you, all right? I'm going to tell you. God convicted me, too, about this. I didn't pay my tithes for a while because I got an income tax. First time in my whole life that I paid $4,000 income tax. I was like, I never, we've never had to pay that kind of money. $4,000, I don't have that money to pay. Oh, wow. I was like, God. I can't afford to pay the tithe in that $4,000. I just can't. We've worked it out. My wife, she's a, she's a budgeter. I mean, she's great at numbers. She's an HR. She handles it in thousands and thousands of dollars. She worked out a budget we just can't afford. So I stopped paying tithe for a while. I give $20 every month or every Sunday, but that wasn't the tithe. That was the offering. I give an offering. I did not pay my tithes. God convicted me a month ago. He said, why aren't you paying your tithes again? I said, God, you know why. And then he showed me this. <laughs> showed me these two little kids fighting over this toy, holding on to it for dear life, not letting it go. <coughs> now, I shared that with you. I want to share about the curse. <laughs> Thank you, God, you lifted the curse off of me. <laughs> Let me say that. Thank you, God, you lifted the curse. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Thank you, God, you lifted the curse. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'll share that. You hold that thought. <laughs> if you look into Moses' law, you'll not find the word, thou shalt not forget to tithe. Hello? You'll never see that in the word of God. Thou shalt not forget the tithe. Huh? Because those words are not in there. <laughs> but, everybody say, but. but. Matthew 23, 23 says this. How terrible it will be for you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your mint, your deal, your coming, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, which is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These are the things you should have practiced without neglecting the others. Underline the words, out, without neglecting the others, you see? These were those rich, religious people that did everything religiously right, but they did not give sacrificially from their own heart unto God. They withheld a portion of the heart. That portion 
is giving, giving, sacrificing unto the Lord. Basically, Jesus reminds us here that there are so many important things we must follow through without neglecting the top. You see? Our Heavenly Father is not forcing us to open our hands and give it up. But we lose out on so many of God's blessings when we fail to follow His word, don't we? I looked up what the mint and dill are, and I learned that they are the tiniest plants. <laughs> they are small, the very small plants. And here Jesus said, you people are making sure that you give one-tenth of these very little leaves. <laughs> but you're paying your tithes are neglected because there's much better manner that you can serve God than give your tithe. You see? They were extending mercy. They were living in faithfulness, measuring out justice. But they were not willing to sacrifice the very thing that could affect their life. Change their lifestyle, huh? Their money. I don't know about you. You can touch anything I have, and basically I'll deal with you, but not in the same kind of strength and anger and animosity or hatred for you as if you touch my wife, my daughter, or my money. Hello? In that order. Don't touch and mess with my wife. Don't touch and mess with my daughter, my kids. And do not mess with my money. My wife will tell you. She will tell you how stringent I am to make sure I know where the money is going, what's being paid, how it's being paid, and on time. I'm very funny about money because I had to struggle most of my life to get where I am, to have the money I have now. And I do not ever want to see a shut-up notice again in my life. I never want to know the pressure of not having money to pay the bills so I don't get kicked out of my apartment, my house. I never want to know the stress and the anxiety that I had that almost destroyed our marriage as part of our problem in our marriage in the past day. I never want that stress again. I'm very stringent. Sometimes a little too stressed over the money to make sure it's A, B, and C. You see? Money. You ask people for their money, and you can see the scour on their face right away. You say, what did you say? You want money? Well, don't look my way. <laughs> huh? And then... If you don't have the scowl, you'll have the, well, I would, but I can't. And they'll go with all the reasons why they can't, right? <laughs> Remember I said, God checked me because I was doing that too? Hmm. Listen. I did not want you to give up paying your tithe, God said. But do not tithe legalistically either and show your brother no mercy. You see? He's telling the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the hypocrites that I don't want you to give up your tithe. And it's important that you not give up your tithe, but don't give up your tithe and give religiously or pay attention to your brother's needs and not paying your tithe. It's all equal to him. It's the same thing. You see? Do not snap off ten leaves from the mint plant to conform to the commands of the law and then go and cheat your brother in your daily business practices. You're a hypocrite if you do. That's what Jesus was saying. Jesus is not after your money. Remember? God doesn't need your money. Amen. What he does need is for you to learn how to trust in him by your, in your giving. How to sacrifice to him in your giving. How to love in him as you're giving. How to be joyful in your giving. You see? Amen. There's reasons other than God needing your money. Because he doesn't. There's reasons that he can teach you to be a better Christian, a man, a woman of God, a testimony of his power, his love, his giving, his mercy, his forgiveness, his sacrifice is demonstrated in your giving. Amen? He doesn't care what you do with your money. He cares what you do with your heart. That's why so many people misunderstand tithing and giving unto the Lord. You're not giving the tithe to your pastor. You're not even giving it to your church. You're giving your tithe unto the Lord. Oh, yeah. And allow God to use that tithe to minister to others. Amen. To care for the house that you enjoy is your church. His house. As it belongs to him. And God will direct what it's used for. And we must trust that he do that. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 9 says that the love gives freely. Hello? Love gives freely. 
And I believe that God loves a cheerful giver, not a begrudgingly. All right, Pastor, you made your point. Here. There's my whole tie. Man. Huh? All right, Pastor, you made your choice. Here's the tie. Don't misuse it. Uh -huh. God has to be give freely as he gives. As to learn how to love freely, to give freely. Jesus' message is through, spread throughout the world. Freely you have been given, then freely we should give. Amen? Amen. <laughs> and Forrest Gump says, and that's all I got to say about that. Life is like a box of chocolate. <laughs> Listen, I will leave you with this note. Your pastor does not need your money. Your pastor doesn't care what you give and what you don't give. Other than the fact that I care what you give and what you don't give, that you're under God's umbrella of Amen. love and protection and provision. You rob God. You're robbing yourself of God's blessings in your life. God says give of the 10%. That's the 10% of your gross income. It's the 10% that you think that you need so badly that you don't want to let go of that little bit. I've learned that I had to pay my tithe regardless of what I pay the government. God said, give unto Caesars what belongs unto Caesar. Give unto God what belongs to God. And God will care for what you have need of. Even before you ask, God knows what you have need of. So I have to give unto the government what I owe them. But I must foremost give unto God what belongs to God. Because he owns and controls everything. He's the supreme authority of everything. So God will move mountains for you to make sure you are doing without nothing. Nothing. Because you're obedient to his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can stand if you like. Praise the Lord. Amen. Did you get something this morning? I sure did. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Every, every Sunday. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I was very nervous about this message. <laughs> I've never given that message. That's my first message on tithing. And God said not to give it. So when I, he said give it, I was kind of, are you sure, God? <laughs> you told me not to. Is this you telling me to, God? Not because of the bills are coming in? <laughs> no. God said, I want you to give the message, and this is what I want you to say about it. I want you to educate the people. So you're being educated by God on what you're to do with your tithes and your offerings. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Yes. All right. To God be the glory. Amen? Amen. Jesus loves me. This I know. For my Bible tells me so. Little ones do him belong. We are weak, but he Strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. My Bible tells me so. Remind each other. Jesus loves you. This I know. For my Bible tells me so. Little ones do him belong. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you. My Bible tells me so. Amen. Thank you, Father God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you're right upon our heart and our mind, God, that we might receive it and act on it. And do it, Father God. Be not a hearer, but a doer. And we ask, Father God, to bless each person as they travel safely home. Guide them, watch over them, protect them, and preserve them. Give them good health. In all that they do, bless their hands, Father God, for they truly bless you in their heart. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Love you, guys.